In 1077, William the Conqueror, ruler of Normandy and England, ordered the construction of a special building. It was to be part palace, part treasury, part prison, and part fortress. It was the White Tower on the banks of the Thames in London, and it was a powerful symbol of the way that the Normans were imposing themselves on this conquered country. They hadn't just brought armies and architecture to mark their authority, they'd also brought their language. The French vocabulary of power forced its way into the English language. Crown and court were both French words, so a castle and tower and the barons who built them, and so were obedience and justice, treason and prison. The Anglo-Saxon kings had governed using the old English language. Now the Normans used French and Latin. English had become the third language in its own country. It would take over 300 years to emerge from the shadows. In the years following the arrival of William's army at Pevensey, the Normans tightened their grip on England, now part of a kingdom that extended across the Channel. Across the land, William's men took over every position of power in the state and in the church. Within 60 years, the monk and historian William of Malmesbury could write, No Englishman today is an earl or bishop or abbot. The newcomers gnaw at the wealth and guts of England, nor is there any hope of ending the misery. He wrote in Latin, written English, which had managed to establish itself so boldly before the conquest, was now dying. It breathed its last here, now Peterborough Cathedral, in the mid-twelfth century, part of Peterborough Abbey. And to Munich is mid him, to Oxenford, to the king, and he yaf him that abodrich. Around the country, monks had been recording the great events of the last 650 years in books known as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. They were written in the language of the people, English, and there was nothing like them anywhere in mainland Europe. He was also at Ramsey, and at Turm, and at Spal, and knew his abbot. Since the Norman conquest of 1066, these unique accounts had been abandoned one by one. The Peterborough Chronicle was the last survivor. In 1154, a monk recorded that the abbey had a new abbot, a man with a very French name of William de Watteville. Choose an author of himself. William de Watteville is Cahatan, good clerk and good man, and fair have it begun. He has made a good beginning, the monk writes. Christ is him, Ura. Christ grant that he may end as well. With this last entry, six and a half centuries of written history came to an end. Old English had ceased to be the language of record in the land. But that didn't mean that it was going to go away. Since the conquest, English in varying dialects had remained the language spoken by 90% of the population, from the south coast to the uplands of southern Scotland, just a few miles north of here. Even further north in Scotland and west in Wales, the culture and language were still Celtic. Old English had continued to develop and change, partly as a result of contact with the language of the Danes, particularly here in the north. The grammar was becoming simpler. More plurals were being formed by adding an S Naman, for example, the Old English plural of name, became names, which would become our names. Prepositions were performing more of the functions of the old word endings, and word order was becoming more fixed. Despite being the officially ignored language, English would continue to evolve and change, and it would endure, resisting and absorbing the invader's language until the time came for it to resume centre stage as a nation's language.
The Peterborough Chronicle of 1154 also recorded that in that year the people of England acquired a new king, Count Henry of Anjou, grandson of William the Conqueror and the first of the Plantagenet kings. A lover of learning, he spoke fluent Latin as well as French, but no English. And the English acquired a new queen, Eleanor of Aquitaine, the daughter of William X of Aquitaine. Henry II was crowned here in Westminster Abbey in a lavish ceremony. The clergy wore silk vestments that were more costly than anything ever seen before in England. The king and queen and the great barons wore silk and brocade robes. The luxury was fitting, it was thought, for an occasion that solemnized the bringing together of so much land and wealth. Henry brought his inheritance of William the Conqueror's land in England and northern France. Eleanor, the greatest heiress in the Western world, brought with her a great swathe of what is now France, from the Loire to the Pyrenees, from the Rhone to the Atlantic. This was a huge kingdom. The greater part of it made up of French-speaking lands across the Channel. As it grew, the English lands and the English language became an ever less significant part of it. French and Latin were even more firmly entrenched as the languages of the court and government of the country. Yet after their coronation, Henry and Eleanor rode in procession along the Strand. And it's reported that the people shouted, Was hail and vivat rex, wishing them long life in English and in Latin. English was still alive in the streets. In the court and royal palaces, new ideas from across the channel were in the air, and new words to express them, words which sang, of courtesy and honour, questing and damsels, jousting and tournaments. French words, every one. The vocabulary of romance and chivalry was heard in England. Del ben che us vuel che us videl mal sufrire, e pues lo mals non puera dantener. Ans merce blancel parta me galme. Eleanor, England's new queen, was considered the most cultured woman in Europe. It was she, more than any other, who patronised the poets and troubadours whose verses and songs created the romantic image of the Middle Ages as the age of chivalry, a glorious vision that was never realised outside the pages of medieval literature. A hundred years before, the word chivalry, formed around the word for horse, had simply meant cavalry. It was the fierceness of the mounted warriors that had carried the day for the Normans at Hastings. And since then, many English peasants had come to know the mounted Norman soldiers as little more than thugs and bullies who ran the country by force. But now, mounted warriors had become knights and the word chivalry came to mean a whole model of ideals and behaviour. Infused with honour and altruism, one that prescribed how to act towards one's liege lord, one's friends and enemies, and of course, fair, cruel ladies. Ideas had shifted, and words with them. It was in Eleanor's reign that French writers brought the stories of Arthur and his knights out of the history books and into poetry, cultivating a language far richer and subtler than the one that the first Norman settlers had spoken and written. The poets rhapsodized about Eleanor, celebrating her as the most beautiful woman in the world, pouring out the impossible longing for the perfect woman that was at the heart of the cult of courtly love. The poetry of affairs of the heart had come to England, 
singing of pain and joy, and beginning a line in literature that runs through Shakespeare's sonnets and the great romantic poets to today's three-minute pop lyrics. Meanwhile, England's native inhabitants were singing their own songs about things in their less exalted condition, things that concern them every day. They sang in their own language, English. That song was first recorded in 1225, making it one of the earliest pieces of English that's still recognisable today. There's not a single French word in it. Words like summer, come, sow, seed and new can be traced right back to the flatlands of Frisia. Spring and wood can be found in the Anglo-Saxon poem Beowulf, and Mary sing and loud in the works authorised by Alfred the Great. There's a pure line of old English vocabulary here, in a song that comes from the peasants and the land, at the opposite end of the social scale from the troubadours' songs. The French language of the Grand Lords hasn't penetrated down to the common people. Certainly the native English and the French overlords lived very different lives. William the Conqueror had introduced the system of feudalism into England, and though evolving, it still defined all economic and social relations, expressed in French words like vilain and vassal, labourer, bailiff and factor. In the country, where 95% of the population lived, the English were essentially serfs, another French word. Not technically slaves, but tied for life to their lord's estate, which they worked for him and, at a subsistence level, for themselves. While the English-speaking peasants lived in small cottages or huts, their French-speaking masters lived privileged lives in their castles. Our modern vocabulary still reflects the distinction between them. English speakers tended the living cattle, which we still call by the old English words of ox or cow. French speakers ate the prepared meat, which came to the table, which we call by the French word beef. In the same way, the English sheep became the French mutton, calf became veal, deer, venison and pig, pork. English animal, French meat, in every case. The English laboured, the French feasted. Where English underlings and French masters lived and worked together, the boundaries between their languages inevitably wore away, and the vocabularies of court and countryside mingled. For example, local men would have been involved in the training and flying of a nobleman's hawks. And some now common words have come to us from falconry. The word falcon itself comes from French, as does leash which referred to the strip of material used to secure the bird, and block on which the bird stood. Our word codger comes from the often elderly man who assisted the falconer by carrying the hawks on a cadge or cage. Bait described the bird beating its wings and trying to fly away. Check meant at first refusing to come to the fist.
Our word lure comes from the leather device still used in training and recalling the hawk. Quarry was the reward given to the falcon for making a kill. When a bird melted, she was set to mew, and from that came the name of the buildings where hawks were kept, mews. Today, that name can still be seen attached to streets where estate agents, rather than hawks, hunt their quarry. We've just heard nine French words that came into English from one activity alone. Steadily, French vocabulary was pouring over English. The French influence on the English language as a whole is enormous in terms of vocabulary, not in terms of grammar, but in terms of vocabulary, it's unmatched by any other language. For example, fruit replaces the Old English wastum pretty quickly. Within the space of about 40 or 50 years, wastum simply isn't used. But the majority of words don't replace Old English, they stand side by side with them. So we have a um, word like apple in Old English, meant any kind of fruit. Whereas what happens is because fruit comes in and is basically uh, expresses that, apple starts to mean a very specific uh, sort of a fruit. I think it's not true to say that, generally speaking, French words came into the language and ousted the Old English words out of it. Generally, what seems to happen is that the, the Old English word simply narrows in meaning. It was now almost 150 years since the Norman Conquest. Though the people at the top had changed, the ascendancy of French was still absolute. Written English, that triumphant achievement of Alfred and English scholars, was dead. And spoken English was being progressively colonised throughout society by French words. But the balance of power and of languages was about to shift. Of course, early 13th century English society consisted of more than English peasants grubbing the land and French-speaking nobility lording it in their castles. Trade was on the increase. The wool trade in particular made parts of England rich. On the proceeds, grand churches were built even in modest villages like this one at North Leach in the Cotswolds. Services would of course be conducted in Latin. Towns were growing, sometimes French and English towns together, as at Norwich and Nottingham. Then, as now, London was the magnet. Its population would double in the course of the 13th century. As feudalism loosened its grip, English speakers would flood in from the country looking for opportunities, a better life. Already established were the French-speaking court officials, administrators, lawyers, merchants, but also craftsmen who gave us the French names for some tools of the trade. Measure, mallet, chisel, pulley, bucket, trowel. This is Petit France in London. Its name shows that it originally housed a community of French immigrants. In the early Middle Ages, there were areas like this in many English towns, home to craftsmen and merchants who'd come here from Normandy. English and French speakers met and mingled in these places, and the English middle classes picked up French words by the thousand. Merchant, money, price, discount, bargain, contract, partner, embezzle. The English didn't just borrow French vocabulary, they took their names. 
Then, as now, names were a matter of fashion, and the fashion in the early 13th century was for French. So out went the good old English Ethelberts, Elfricks, and Ethelstains, Dunstons, Wolfstons, and Wolfricks, and in came the newfangled Richards and Roberts, Simons and Stevens, Johns, Jeffreys, and most popular of all, Williams. It seemed that everywhere, French was the name of the game. If this process had continued, whereby French percolated and penetrated into every area of English society, then French could eventually have engulfed English. That didn't happen. Why not? One critical reason was that because of particular historical events, French speakers in England became cut off from their cultural and linguistic roots. In 1204, the reigning monarch John, King of Normandy, Aquitaine and England, lost his Norman lands in a war with the much smaller kingdom of France. The Norman dukedoms, ancestral lands of William the Conqueror and cultural homelands were part of another empire now. As long as the French nobility and middle classes who lived in England kept contact with their homelands in Normandy, as long as they thought of themselves as French and married within French families, their identity and language were secure. When they lost their connections across the Channel, their language began to lose its grip on English. One thing that happened was that French speakers, even within the noblest families, began to look for wives not from across the Channel, but in England. They married English speakers, and in doing so, they married, as it were, into the English language as well. It's said that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. It's likely that by the middle of the 13th century, many children in families which would previously have been French speaking were learning English from their mothers or nurses. No doubt many of the children of Anglo-French marriages grew up bilingual, perhaps speaking one language to the servants in the castle kitchen and another at dinner in the Great Hall. By 1250, there's even some evidence that children of the nobility were having to learn French from a written primer, grappling with the vocabulary of what was becoming effectively a foreign language. By the middle of the 13th century, more and more French speakers throughout society were themselves beginning to speak English, becoming bilingual. The result was that while French itself became more of a foreign language, French vocabulary, French words, continued to stream into English. Many more words are recorded after 1250 than before. Abbey, attire, censor, defend, figure, malady, music, parson, plead, sacrifice, scarlet, spy, stable, virtue, marshal, park, reign, beauty, clergy, cloak, country, fool, air, pillory. And because French was the international language of trade, it acted as a conduit for words from the markets of the East. Arabic words that gave to the English saffron, mattress, hazard, camphor, alchemy, loot, amber, and syrup. Our phrase checkmate comes through French from the Arab Sharmat, the king is dead. As we've heard, very often the imports didn't replace existing English words, but settled down with them, each word adopting a slightly different meaning. The same thing had happened with English and Old Norse, this layering effect. So, a young English hare came to be named by the French word leveret. English swan, French signet. A small English axe is a French hatchet. Ask 
English and demand from French have slightly different meanings, as do bit and morsel, wish and desire, might and power, room and chamber. On the surface, some of these words appear to be interchangeable, and sometimes they are. But more interestingly, there are fine differences. That's the beauty of it. Answer is not quite respond. Begin isn't always commence. Liberty isn't always freedom. Shades of meaning, representing new shades of thought, were massively absorbed into our language at that time. The range of what I would call almost synonyms became one of the glories of English contributing to the language's precision and flexibility, allowing its speakers and writers over the centuries to select very precisely the right word. Rather than replace English, French was helping equip and enrich the language for the central role that it was on its way to reassuming. Towards the end of the 13th century, a new idea of the English people was being born. The Norman lands across the Channel were a foreign country now. Even the families who traced their roots back to William the Conqueror's Norman followers, men with French names and French blood, started calling themselves true-born Englishmen. Behind me is the tomb of Edward I, the hammer of the Scots, it says there, in Latin. Latin was the language of official business. But when the French King Philip threatened invasion of England in 1295, Edward used the English language as a symbol of nationhood to galvanize support. If Philip is able to do all the evil he means to, from which God protect us, he plans to wipe out our English language entirely from the earth, he said. The old language, reborn, could now be a rallying point for a new mongrel people. The invasion never came. And though Edward made the English language a symbol for the country, he didn't elevate it to official use. Latin and French were still the languages of state affairs. It was Edward's direct ancestor, William the Conqueror, who more than two centuries before had enshrined Latin and French as the written languages of state, banishing English. But as the 13th century gave way to the 14th, English was becoming the one language out of the three that everyone in the country could be counted on to know. In 1325, for instance, the chronicler William of Nassington could write, Latin can no one speak, I trow, but those who it from school do know. And some know French, but not Latin, who are used to court and dwell therein. And some know Latin, though just in part, whose use of French is less than art. And some can understand English, who neither Latin know nor French. But unlettered or learned, old or young, all understand the English tongue. And around the country, written English was emerging from the shadows. Songs in the French troubadour style, but with English words, appeared, as did a few vernacular poems. In some places, the old English religious homilies had continued to be copied and circulated. The bestiary, in which birds and animals were portrayed and their behaviour made the basis for lessons in Christian morality, was a particular medieval form. They were usually written as here in Latin. But in a late 13th century example, the text is not in Latin, but in English. The wild deer has two properties. He draws out the viper from the stone with his nose and swallows it. The venom causes the deer to burn. Then he rushes to the water and drinks. The devil is like the whale. He tempts men to follow their sinful lusts, and in return they find ruin. It is the weak in faith, the little ones, that he thus beguiles. And it was an animal which, in just a few years' time, would, by a cruel twist of fate, give English its greatest boost yet, a small black rodent with a Latin name. Ratus ratus, the black rat. In 1348, 
ancestors of these black rats deserted a ship that coming from the continent had docked near Weymouth. They carried a deadly cargo, a germ that modern science calls Pasteurella pestis, that the 14th century named the Great Pestilence and that we know as the Black Death. Plague had come to Britain. Infected rats carried the deadly germ east, then north. They sought out human habitations, building nests in the floors, climbing the wattle and door walls, shedding the infected fleas that fed on their blood and transmitted bubonic plague. It's been estimated that between a quarter and a third of England's population of four million died. In some places, whole communities were wiped out. This is Ashwell in Hertfordshire. In the bell tower of the church, some desperate soul, perhaps the parish priest, scratched a poignant record on the wall in bad Latin. The first pestilence was in 1350 minus one. 1350, pitiless, wild, violent. Only the dregs of the people live to tell the tale. The dregs were those of the English-speaking peasantry who'd survived. Though the Black Death was a human catastrophe, it set in train a series of social upheavals which would speed the English language along the road to full restoration as the real and recognised language of the nation. So... For one thing, the Black Death dealt Latin, the language of the church, a body blow. Where people live communally, as the clergy did in monasteries and other religious orders, the incidence of infection and death was disproportionately high. At a local level, many parish priests either caught the plague from tending their parishioners or simply ran away. As a result of the plague, the Latin-speaking clergy in some parts of England were reduced by almost a half. Many of their replacements were barely literate laymen, whose only language was English. England after the Black Death was a very different place. In many parts of the country, there was hardly anyone left to work the land or tend the livestock. The acute shortage of labour meant that those who did the work had the power to break from their feudal past and demand better conditions, higher wages. Times were changing. Wages rose, the price of property fell. Working people seized the opportunities they'd never had before. The fortunes of the common people were changing. They were rising through society and they took their English with them. By 1385, English had replaced French in the schoolroom and as education and literacy spread, so did the demand for books in English. And English was already finding a place in the state and in the law. In 1362, for the first time in three centuries, English was acknowledged as a language of official business. Since the conquest, court cases had been heard in French. Now the law recognized that too few people understood that language, probably because many of the educated lawyers had died in the plague. From now on, it was declared, cases could be pleaded, showed, defended, debated and judged in English. In the same year, 1362, Parliament was opened here at Westminster. For the first time ever, the Chancellor addressed the Assembly not in French, but in English. 
For the worship and honor of God, King Edward hath supplied his prelates, dukes, earls, barons, and other lords of his realm to his parliament holden at Westminster, the year of the king six and... And soon, English would once again be the language of kings. The country hadn't had an English-speaking monarch since Harold had been hacked to death at Hastings in 1066. In 1399, King Richard II was deposed by Henry, Duke of Lancaster. Parliament was summoned here, to the Great Hall at Westminster. The dukes and lords, spiritual and temporal, were assembled. The royal throne, draped in cloth of gold, stood empty. Then Henry stepped forward, crossed himself, and claimed the crown. And in a great symbolic moment, he made his speech not in the Latin language of state business or the French language of the royal household, but in what the official history calls his mother tongue, English. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, he, Henry of Lancaster, challenge this realm of England and the corona with all the members and the appurtenances. As he that am descended by richt line of the blood, coming from the good Lord, King Henry III. And for that richt, that God of his grace hath sent me, with the help of my kin and of my friends, to recover it. The which realm was in point to be undone for the fault of governance and undoing of the God allowers. And so Henry, Duke of Lancaster, became King Henry IV, and English was once again a royal language. The tide seemed to be turning in its favour. By the end of the 14th century, it was on course to regain its status as the first language of the country. And now it also had a literary champion who could harness its full capabilities to produce great writing, Geoffrey Chaucer. When that April, with his sure as soot, the drocht of March hath pursed to the root, and bathed every vine in such liquor of which virtue engendered is the floor, when Zephyrus ache with his sweeter breath, in spirit hath in every halt and haith the tender crops, and the young son hath in the ram his halfy course run, and small fools make an melodie that slip in all the nicht with open ye, so pricketh him nature in her courage, than long and folk to go on pilgrimage. Chaucer wrote those opening showery lines to the Canterbury Tales more than six centuries ago in 1387. For millions of people since, the Canterbury Tales have been the flowering of the medieval English language and also a great staging post for English literature. Chaucer, pictured here as one of his own pilgrims, wasn't the only writer of his time, and he didn't invent the language he was working with. But he, more than any other, recognized its richness, the potential in having at his disposal vocabularies from high and low society, drawn from French and Old English, and he worked it to the full. Chaucer was a Londoner, and an important man, with connections to the royal family and a high position in the civil service. He'd traveled widely, perhaps even been a spy, and he knew Latin and French. It might have been expected, like many other English poets of the time, to write in either of those languages for an exclusive audience. But he didn't. He chose to write in English, the English that was spoken in London. Language of, uh, of London would have been a, a huge mixture. You've got people coming in from um, the central Midlands, from the northern Midlands. From the northern Midlands, they'd have bringing more Scandinavian terms because it's an area of strong Scandinavian settlement. But we'd have also have heard French loan words, which people would have heard in literature as well. So it's 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 a, a vibrant variety of English.
befell that in that season on a day, in Southwark at the Tabard, as he lay ready to wenden on me pilgrimage to Canterbury with full devout courage, at night was come into that hostelry well nine and twenty in a company of sombre. This is where the Tabard Inn used to stand. Now it's the rather dismal backyard of Guy's Hospital. This is where Chaucer's pilgrims gather before setting out on their pilgrimage to Canterbury. The buildings may have gone, but Chaucer's characters, a cannily constructed cross-section of medieval society, live on in his writing. A knicht there was, and that a worthy man, that for the team that he first began to read an oot, he loved chivalry, truth and honor. There was also a non, a prioress, that of her smiling was full simple and coy. A merchant was there with a forked beard in motelay, and he on horse he sat. A good wife was there of Besida Bath, but she was somdel deaf, and that was scath. The miller was a stout carl for the nones, full big he was of brown and ache of bonus. The pilgrims set off for Canterbury, a journey of about three days then, and to pass the time they told each other stories. The stories have a range of styles, from serious moral fables to bawdy farces with episodes that wouldn't be out of place in a carry-on film. What Chaucer did most brilliantly was to choose and tailor his language to suit every tale and its teller. The creation of mood and tone and the realisation of characters through the language is something we expect of writers today. So it's difficult to realise how extraordinary it was when Chaucer did it. He showed, he proved, that reformed English was fit for great literature, which gives him a key part in our story. This gentil cock had in his governance seven hennes for to do all his plaisance, which were his sisters and his paramours and wonder lick to him as of colours, of which the firest hewed on her throat was clepped fire damosele pertelot. Can you tell us uh, what language is predominating in this particular passage? Well, you've got so many French words, haven't you? They really hit you between the eyes. Even today, I think, you'd, you'd notice them. Gouvernance, plaisance, Paramour. In fact, uh, Chaucer is, is uh, thought to be the, the person who introduced paramour into the English language himself. And those words, plaisance, gouvernance, all appear from about the 1350s, so they're quite new at a time um, when Chaucer used them in Nun's Priest Tale. The question, of course, is why is he doing this? Um, well, it's odd, really, isn't it? Because this is a story about chickens. <laughs> it's a story about a cock and his hens. And you'd have thought that perhaps a, a less refined language might be in order. But Chaucer is playing with the whole idea of, a, a, of a, an exalted style. And so he's, he's investing these, uh, um, these hens and cocks with uh, a, a feeling of, of great literary quality. You know, it's, it becomes almost a mock epic. Chaucer not only used existing French words for poetic effect, he also introduced his own elevated synonyms, sometimes bypassing an English word in favour of a more stylish French borrowing. So, English had the perfectly good hard as a noun. Chaucer borrowed the French word difficulté. In place of unhap, he gave us disadventure. For shenship, dishonesté. For building, edifice, for unconning, ignorant, and for meaning, significance. But Chaucer wasn't just ensnared with the elegance of French, he also cherished the directness and earthiness of English, and used it, for example, in The Miller's Tale, where the student, Absalom's midnight assignation with the neighbor's wife, doesn't go quite according to plan. This Absalom can weep his mouthful dree. Dirk was the nicht as pitch or as the coal, and at the window would she put her hole, and Absalom him fill ne bet ne worse, but with his mouth he kissed her naked airs. The language, of course, is predominantly Old English, and again, Chaucer is aware of what linguists would call register. He knows that you have to have a particular style for a particular purpose. 
With the Miller's tale, we have both the Miller himself, who is a man of extraordinary quality, so he opens doors simply by running at them with his head, which is a clever trick. And the story itself is, uh, as you know, about bottoms out of windows and other such thing. And of course, in that case, it's appropriate to have a simple, earthy style. He knows that if he's talking about basic, earthy stuff, he might as well use good old English words. And I think it's actually marked that use by not using many French words. I think people would have picked up on that. We certainly do. The style seems very direct, almost colloquial. Of course, that's literary artifice. But it does seem direct and colloquial, and that's as a complete result of the way in which he's using the language. The language he'd have heard on the streets, words like s, meaning arse, I'm afraid, and other such rude words. Scholars dispute how much vocabulary Chaucer actually introduced into English. With Old English, he certainly reintroduced words which hadn't been written down since before 1100, probably because they weren't considered important or seemly enough. Words like churlish, farting, friendly, learning, loving, restless, swiven, wasp, wifely and willingly. This is where the pilgrims who'd beguiled the miles with their various tales would have been making for. The shrine of Thomas a Becket in Canterbury Cathedral. The brilliant archbishop, son of a French merchant, had been brutally murdered in 1170 by knights acting on the wishes, if not instructions, of Henry II, that first Plantagenet, whose wife Eleanor had done so much to promote the courtly French language, which Chaucer was now mining so expertly. In Chaucer's day, this area around the cathedral and the nearby streets would have been thronged with pilgrims from all over the country. Well, the thronging hasn't changed, but they would have been speaking in the dialect of their homes. English wasn't uniform in the way it was spoken, and Chaucer himself in the Reeves tale gives us literature's first fully northerner, who speaks with flat vowels. He says him for home, na for no, gan for gone, and nan for non, all pronunciations that would be quite understandable in the northeast of England today. Chaucer himself worried about whether his work would be mispronounced or wrongly copied or just misunderstood in other parts of the country. He bids one of his poems, Troilus and Cressida, a rather worried farewell, voicing a concern he must also have felt for the Canterbury Tales. Go, little book, and for there is so great diversity in English and in reading of our tongue, so pray God that none misread they, ne they mismetre for deaf out of tongue, and read where so thou be or else song that thou be understand. E God beseech. Of course, Chaucer's books, particularly the Canterbury Tales, were understood. His language, the language of late 14th century London, would become, with some later modifications, the standard form of English, and his genius in harnessing that language to serve his vision as a writer would guarantee that it lived on. A century and a half after his death, Geoffrey Chaucer was famous enough for this tomb to be put in Westminster Abbey. In the intervening years, his tales had spread round the country and delighted listeners and readers ranging from London merchants to the future Richard III. Before the 15th century was out, the Canterbury Tales had been printed by Thomas Caxton, ensuring the future of Chaucer's work and furthering the process by which Southern English, Chaucer's English, would become the standard. Chaucer was the first poet to be buried here in what's become Poet's Corner. It's appropriate for the man who not only entertained and delighted in his own work, but who, through expanding the capabilities of the English language, created a standard and a platform for those who followed. <laughs>